The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your promise that you would never leave us and never forsake us. Remind us of your faithfulness. And Lord, make our hearts be sensitive and aware to your presence and our ears open to your voice through your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It was one of those times I spent most of the week preparing for one message and ended up with another. I had studied the New Testament reading in Corinthians, and when push came to shove, I just felt the Holy Spirit redirect me toward the psalm. So later in, in the week, you might hear some words of hope on Facebook from that 1 Corinthians reading, so it doesn't go to waste. I believe the greatest thing in all the world is the true Christian faith. It's too precious to be mixed with anything earthly. It is a God-given gift that offers life, hope, and sanity in a world full of death, despair, and insanity. That is why I get so angry when I see the faith twisted, corrupted, and shamed. I am furious and saddened when I read of yet another pastor or priest or youth leader who's been involved in immorality or financial fraud. I was furious, saddened, and sickened on January 6th as I saw insurrectionists carry a cross and a sign saying Jesus saves along with their symbols of hate as they violently stormed our capital. Our faith is precious and holy and truly sacred above all else. This morning, let's look at Psalm 111 and learn some lessons about our precious Christian faith. In verse 1, the first part of verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. First of all, we see here our faith is an effective faith. It's a faith of the heart. The Lord desires that we praise Him with all of our heart, with all of our feeling, with, with all that is within us. He does not want empty compliance where we just go through the motions because we know we're supposed to do that. He wants a people who love him and worship him from the heart and obey him out of love. He is seeking people who will worship in spirit and in truth, again, with everything that is inside of us. The first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all of our mind, and all of our strength. True faith is emotional. There's a powerful emotional part to it. It has times of joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. And, and we love those times, and, and we should. We need to be open to times of joy in our Christian walk, and especially in Christian worship. But it also has times of painful but holy lament and grief at the feet of our Savior as we pour out our sorrow over our sins and the sins of our family, the sins of our nation or just the hardships that God allows life to bring to us. Even laughter and tears need to be part of our walk with God and our worship. There needs to be times that we have that joy unspeakable and we even laugh right here in this building. But there also needs to be times where our hearts are broken and there's tears going down our cheeks even in this building. Every part of our God-created emotions should be poured into our worship and part of our walk with our Lord. A faith without feeling is missing something. Missing something very important, even crucial. It leaves an emptiness, and it's less than what God desires from us. Secondly, we see our faith is also a faith of intellect. Look at verses 2 through 4. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. And verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who live accordingly. His praise endures forever. True Christianity includes emotion, but it's not only emotion. It's not all emotion. It's also the beginning of wisdom, and it brings good understanding. You don't have to check your brain at the door to be a believer in Christ. True faith uses the redeemed mind to look at the world 
and see God's marvels in majesty and in goodness. Verse 2 shows us using our minds to seek out God's greatness. Or the ESV I read says, study God's greatness. A grounded faith is confident enough to know that true science is merely discovering the works of God. It's the human mind used to look at what's going on around us and study it and discover what God put there in nature. There's no need to be threatened or, or defensive but by the facts of science. When science goes off track in, into scientism, replacing faith with a faith in human reason, then we need to challenge that. But e even then, without defensiveness. A mature faith uses the redeemed mind to remember the goodness of God. Verse 4 points us in that direction. He's caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The believing mind sees the fingerprints of God in all of life, in all of our circumstances, and in all of creation. In the beauty of a sunset, the majesty of the Grand Canyon, in the vastness of outer space, in the intricacy of the subatomic world, the powerful microscopes show. But our faith is not merely cold intellect. At its best, Christianity is a redeemed mind set on fire by the Holy Spirit. Write that down in your mind, if, if not in paper. At its best, our faith is the redeemed mind set on fire by the Holy Spirit. It's not emotion or intellect. God made them both. He wants to be worshipped with both, served with both. And our faith and our worship needs to involve our thinking, our brain, and our heart both. We think, we study, and we're moved a heartfelt love to spirit-filled worship and praise. True faith is always a faith of praise. Look at the last part of verse 4. It says, the Lord is gracious and merciful. It's recognizing his goodness. Last part of verse 1 says, Okay, the first part of verse 1, excuse me. Praise the Lord, I will give thanks unto the Lord with my whole heart. That's worship and praise. Last part of verse 9 says, The Lord is holy and awesome is his name. Again, recognizing his majesty and just spontaneously worshiping him for who he is. And last part of verse 10, His praise endures forever. Praise is just saturated throughout this psalm and most of the psalms. And our life needs to be worship-oriented. The last part of verse B shows us that, verse 1, shows us our faith is a corporate faith. It says, in the company of the upright and among the congregation. We are created and redeemed to worship together. That's why the book of Hebrews tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And this is why this pandemic is so vicious on the mind, heart, and soul. It pushes us toward an isolation even in worship. But joining a congregation online is far better than sitting alone with your Bible and songbook. There needs to be some sense of connection and at least watching like this, you're, you're seeing it live or in live recording, and you're seeing that there's other people here, you're hearing other verse voices during the re responses, you're not alone. You're part of a body. Not in the way you'd like to be, but you're still part of a worshiping group. If your health doesn't allow you to go to church, then please let church come to you. But we need to join our hearts with other believers as best we can. Now some people have conditions that may never allow them to attend a live church service physically. The Lord understands that, and I understand that too. It's a blessing that modern technology allows so many churches to be online and bring the Word of God in worship to the home. But if you're able, when this pandemic lets up, Perhaps after you're vaccinated, you need to safely worship with other believers as soon as you feel that you can do it safely. But until that day comes, I encourage you to faithfully assemble together online. Right now, I, I, we, I would encourage anyone to err on the side of caution. I'm glad that many of you feel safe to be here and we're doing things as safely as we can with masks and social distancing and this plexiglass up here. 
as all things we're doing trying to keep you safe. But right now, get the vaccine. Wear a mask. Social distance. Stay at home as much as you can. Do what's wise. Do, do what's cautious. But look for the day when God lifts this curse from our land and we're able to come together. Pray for that day. In verse 6, we see our faith as a powerful faith and ultimately will be a victorious faith. We read, He has shown His people the power of His works, that He may give them the heritage of the nations. A powerful faith that in God's timing is going to be a victorious faith. We serve a God of miracles. We should pray for the sick and expect them to be healed and see, see them being healed. In, in the providence of God, for some reason, not everyone we pray for is healed, but many are, and we should expect that, and, and we do see that. We should pray for amazing things to happen in God's timing and God's way. And again, we do see that. A few months ago, who would have thought that today we could say that our church mortgage is totally paid off? It was paid off quickly, years ahead of time. But in God's way, he brought it to pass. Pray for outrageous things because we serve an outrageous God by the world's standards. His thoughts are not like human thoughts, and his ways are not like human ways. Nothing is impossible for God. We need to really believe that. We really need to expect that God will work in ways that don't make sense to the human mind. Now this psalm talks about the uh, heritage of the nations being given to Israel. And this psalm was written for ancient Israel. And God partly fulfilled giving them that heritage by giving them victory over the nations of Canaan. And then in subsequent centuries, victories over many surrounding nations. But it will not be completely fulfilled for them or us until King Messiah comes again to establish the throne of David over the entire earth. We have a victorious faith, but in this present age, we only see part of that victory. We won't see the fullness of it until Christ comes and establishes a new heavens and in a new earth. As New Testament believers, we must always remember that the kingdom of Christ is not of this present age. The church is a spiritual body, not a nation like ancient Israel. Our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with forces of spiritual wickedness in high places. Our ultimate enemy is Satan, not any earthly politician or religious figure. Our weapons, our weapons need to be prayer, praise, the word of God, and the sacraments. And I would strongly urge you, do not let yourself get sucked into anti-Semitism. Never forget our Savior is a Jew. He was born of the seed of Mary. The apostles were Jews. Every book of the Bible, with the exception of Luke, Acts, and possibly Job, were written by Jews. Hating Jews is unbiblical and of the spirit of Antichrist. It is a shame that at times in church history, the church has fallen into anti-Semitism. And it's crazy. Because they were killing Jews in the name of a Jewish Messiah. We can praise God that those days are, are behind us, but we need to work and pray that they stay behind us. Run from anti-Semitism. It is trying to infiltrate the church even today. In verses 7 and 8, we see our faith is a biblical faith. It says, The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are true. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and equity. His commandments are the written word of God. Some translations say precepts, the same idea. They stand fast forever and ever. The word of God is unchanging. Holy Scripture is the God-breathed Word of God, every syllable of it. It is the ultimate authority for the church and for each and every believer. If anything contradicts the teaching of Scripture, we must reject it. Then we see also, last of all, our faith is a faith of redemption and covenant. Verse 5 says, He has given food to those who fear Him, 
he shall ever be mindful of his covenant. In verse 9, he sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. God has worked through covenant. From the times of Adam, Noah, Moses, David, and the apostles. Every Sunday, in the prayer of consecration during communion, you'll hear me read the words of Jesus as he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. God brings redemption through covenant. A covenant is much, much more than just a contract. It's a sacred agreement between two parties. The covenant between God and Abraham was solemnized in Genesis 15 by the blood of sacrifices. The covenant with Israel through Moses was solemnized by the blood of bulls and lambs. The covenant of redemption in Christ is solemnized with the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And all those other sacrifices were only pointing toward the ultimate sacrifice, the cross where God the Son shed his blood for the sin of all who would ever believe in him. For you and me as we respond to the Spirit's call to trust in Jesus Christ and turn from our sin and turn to Christ. Come, put your faith in Jesus Christ as the God-sent Redeemer who died to pay for your sin and be saved. Believe he is the sinless Son of God who died on a Roman cross and has risen from the grave, and you will receive the forgiveness of all your sins and be made a part of God's forever family, which is the Holy Church. Redemption is salvation and freedom. God wants to set you free. He wants to free us from everything that binds us, from the habits, the addictions, the sins, the wounds of our past. The Lord is a healer and a Redeemer that sets His people free. Come to Christ not only for salvation, not only for eternal life, but for healing. Healing of your spirit as well as your body. Freedom from the things that bind you and hold you back. These things and so much more are what our faith is all about. It's holy. It's precious. It's life-giving. It's life-changing. It brings hope in the midst of darkness, joy in the midst of pain, and life eternal in the face of physical death. Every one of us who believe in Christ will someday lay this body aside in death or in rapture. But that's not the end of the believer. That is the beginning of life eternal in its fullness. And it's all about Jesus Christ. From start to finish, the faith is all about Jesus. Whenever we lose a Christ-centeredness, we're off track. In our personal life, in our walk with Christ, in the church, it's got to be all about Jesus from start to finish. Every believer is an ambassador of the faith and of Christ Jesus. May God give us grace not to dishonor him with our words actions, or attitudes. Please, please be careful with your post on social media. People are watching. If you're going to post things that may be seen as hateful by some, then for the sake of the kingdom, either don't post it, or if you do post it, please don't post a scripture right after it. Because that really gives a mixed message and brings shame on the faith. The faith is too precious to be mixed with wood, hay, and stubble. You, you really are the only Bible that some people are ever going to read. You are the only church that they will ever see. Be careful what you're showing. Be careful what they see in you. Because as a representative of Christ, they will associate what you say, what you do with our Savior. Hold this faith, this faith is something too precious to be mixed with anything mean-spirited. Hold high the cross of Christ with honor, with respect, with love. Do it honor. Don't do it shame. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen.